All right, so uh, that's that for Mystery Tour record. Now we have a bunch of tracks that are just kind of loose singles. Uh, All You Need Is Love, that was uh, the big televised broadcast Lennon did, had people singing all around him. Oh. Just like Hey Jude, they, they did that for both the songs. Um, they, I think it was like uh, their plan was that since they weren't touring, but they wanted their audience to have access to their presence in one way or another, they started to do these movies, like, you know, rock videos, basically, mm-hmm. you know, uh, whenever a new single came out. It was always really exciting ah. to, to, to view them. Uh, all you need is love. And there's a little uh, quirky time signature thing in here, just for a moment. I don't know if you noticed it. Uh, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, one, two, three. It has a little short measure of three, four in there. Okay. All right. Um, so, nothing you can do that can't be done. So really, what we're doing is a cycle of chords all around the key of G. Right? Okay. It's just you know For the whole song. D E minor. This one five six one five six. And then we have this movement, common movement again, just like Penny Lane on the C chord. And then we go to the D. And instead of just doing your standard, like say in um, uh, whiter shade of pale, it goes. On this song, again, probably Martin's influence. Uh. And it honors that little measure of 3 4 again, too. It just jumps right in. Okay. Da, 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 boom. Right? Right mm-hmm. in there. All right. So, um, now this that's kind of like uh, interesting messing with suspension chords again. What we have is. Uh, he's like, the progression is going G to A7 to D7. Now, there's there's our secondary dominant. This is 5-7 of the 5 chord, A7 going to D7. If I put my D7 here, there's A7 there. Boom, okay. boom, boom. But using that method I was teaching. But he sings the suspension on the A7 chord. He doesn't sing... Which actually would have been kind of cool, but um, he keeps that suspension on the A7. You know, wah, 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 wah. again, back to the hailing, back to the 1800s kind of sound. Okay, you know. yeah. And uh, so we do that twice. We go G, A, 7, D with the suspension. And those chords are? All right, again. Again, notice the barbershop quartet sound, the secondary mm-hmm. dominant of the, the sixth chord of E minor, B7 going to E minor. And again, using the bar chord system, there's E minor, there's its secondary dominant. All right, so that's B7 right there. I'm just playing it over here now. So, now we have a line. Um, all right. And because he's singing... Uh, there so I don't know if he actually plays the suspension uh, this is one thing I, I mentioned this before this happens in uh, uh, baby or rich man quite a few Beatles songs uh, seeing the suspension against the the natural third of the chord to me is like a big no-no and it was rife all throughout the 90s oh. all throughout the music of the 90s I couldn't, I, that's, this is just my own personal allergy. Most people don't seem to mind this that much, but it drives me freaking <laughs> crazy. The only, the, the minor ninth is a horrible interval when you isolate it. Like if I sing, uh, right, if I played the D7 chord, which they probably do play a straight D7 without this suspension, but they sing this note against this note. Let me see if I could demonstrate what it sounds like. Uh, oh. Now, 
Now, the thing is, um, here's the distance. It's not a pretty interval. That's a minor ninth. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. This is what I call the minor ninth rule. It, it should basically be never used in a chord except in um, really complex dominant chords. Then you can get away with it. Oh. Uh, I, I don't like the sound that much, but for some reason I could always forgive the Beatles. So I, oh. I don't know why. You know, I just love them so much, so <laughs> they could do whatever. Uh, Except die. That was the one bad thing. <laughs> Two left. And breaking up. That was another bad thing. Uh, no, actually, it's probably good that they broke up when they did. All right, so... Um, all right, so... Uh, then they... Th I mean, there's nothing else to this song. Right. Then they repeat the chorus. If you, uh, I, I, I don't have the details, I mean I have the, uh, but I'm, what I'm trying to find is in the extended edi ending, which the Beatles had a penchant for at this point, uh, supposedly you could pick out an orchestra playing green sleeves in the background. Da, da, oh, okay, da, right. Da, 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 da. Uh, also, uh, In the Mood, I think, uh, what's hmm. his name? Was it Tommy Dorsey? Yeah. Ba -da -da, ba -ba -ba -ba. So there's something. In fact, I think they got sued over that. Like they, oh man. They quote in there. There's a bunch of weird, like Charles Ivesian kind yeah. of like clashy clashing, stuff. Yeah, clashing yeah. stuff. Um, so, but that's about it for that song. Uh, it, it was uh, it was broadcast over satellite, you know, which was very cool. Um, oh, okay. All right, we got ten more minutes. Let's see if we can stuff another song. In. <coughs> All right, see the baby or rich man. Well, baby, uh, look, baby or rich man is nothing. It's like two chords. That's no. Oh, that's one reason it's a G. By the way, Lynn McCartney, they work together on head to head on this song. Was that right? And that's why it's really hard to tell whose song it is. Huh? But uh, McCartney and Lennon thought this was like the pinnacle of their songwriting. Really? Yeah, which is so bizarre. The song is just... What? Oh, that's kind of cool. I like that. All right, this, uh, yeah, I, I do, I like what's going on here. I, the reason I had a hard time finding the chords was it was a clever little trick they did. <coughs> we're, uh, pardon me, we're in the Mixolydian mode right now. In the key of C. Okay. All right. All right. And I thought the progression went... Instead it goes. Uh, so we're doing four, five, one to C. So this is an example of mixing modes, and it's very, very subtle. It's okay. very subtle. It's hard to really notice it, but we're leaning on the G chord as if it's the root. That's the trick. Remember, I was saying before you lean on, you lean on a chord enough, the brain just right. suddenly says, "Okay, that's home." I mean, you can end the song on that. Right. But then they go. takes us to C as a root. Okay. And that's kind of cool. Uh, one other thing they do is they, uh, now that you found, found another key. <laughs> McCartney does that. Again, there's a third against the fourth. This is this sound. All right. All right. But I kind of like it. <laughs> yeah. Even though it's a taboo for me. Okay. There is something cool about the textures of this song. 
using that strange. I don't know what that instrument is. Some yeah, it, it, for some reason I just sort of think that's Harrison's influence with sitar or whatever going on. And if you listen closely on that last one, there's a um, there's a backwards piano that comes in, just like in uh, uh, what was that song by Queen? Da -da 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 -da. It's not "We Will Rock You." It was another song. Oh, uh, another one bites the dust. Oh. They had a backwards. It's a cool sound, like the because the piano has such a like a big, profound, uh, dynamic range. So when you first hit a chord on it, it's like. Um, you know, like the end right. of, uh, you know, uh, Sergeant Peppers. Um, but when you reverse it, it's like this thing where it goes, you know, it just oh. builds up into a crescendo. You could hear it here uh, on top of that strange... Um, hear that? Oh, yeah. It's very subtle, but it's very cool. And it cuts off real quick because the, it's the end of the attack. And this is just one to four. combination of real piano with the undercurrent of the uh, reverse piano. There's something about the sound of the bass in this too that I, I can see why they'd be proud of this song, but it was about the production. It wasn't about the actual essence of the song. Oh, okay. You know, um, I, I could see why they high five this one, because there is some really cool production tricks going on. Uh, and I think they're probably thinking that they, they reach a sort of pinnacle in their production capacity. There's a lot of subtle, cool tricks going on here, no question about it. Um, but it's a simple song. I mean, it's, yeah. you know. You, 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 you alternate between G and C for quite a bit of it on the verses yes, on this. Yes, indeed. Yeah, so. yeah. And, uh, uh, one thing I wanted to mention, too, is the ambiguity of the lyrics. I remember I started noticing this as a kid because, you know, there was all this, like, anti-establishment, anti-materialism, you know, all this, like, sentiment going on about the bullshit of mainstream society. And here he's saying, Baby, You're a Rich Man, and you'd think it's going to be cynical. But Baby, You're a Rich Man, too, just like me. Oh, isn't that cool? You know, uh, how's it feel to be one of the beautiful people? You think it's sarcastic, but then it's it's not. Yeah. It reminds mm -hmm. me of, uh, there's a post Steely Dan song uh, Donald Fagan wrote. Uh, it was about what a wonderful world this would be. It was this futuristic look into, like, what the world would be in, you know, a hundred years from now. Mm -hmm. Everybody's wearing spandex. And I thought the whole thing was just cynical kind of, like, satire. But apparently he was, that was his <laughs> vision. <you know? laughs> And uh, the song Peg is when rock Peg, it will come back to you. I thought that was a negative song. It was being sarcastic. But no, it was an actual, hey, you made it in the movies. Thumbs up. Good work for you, you know. Uh, so. Rock stars getting rich. Jeez. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, well, okay. Listen, I think we've, we've hit, I think we've hit the mark for today. Okay. The only other, uh, Lady Madonna, I'm not going to touch the inner light. It was a Harrison song. I didn't think much of it. Lady Madonna is the only other one left okay. of the singles, and then we're going to go into the White Album. All right. This is coming up next with Mr. Caggiano. Yeah, so we'll be looking at next time Lady Madonna back in the USSR. <laughs> Dear Prudence and perhaps Glass Onion, which is, Glass Onion is a very intense... I, I can't remember this at all. Ah, uh, okay. There is a lot of chordal experimentation on the White Album, and I, I tell you the truth, 
I, I never liked the White Album, album for two reasons. One is that you can hear a distinct split between Lennon and McCartney. They're doing two separate things. Secondly, I thought the production value of the entire record was so disappointing. Huh. And George Martin had even said to the guys, instead of making a big fat double album, pick the best of the best and we'll produce the hell out of this and make this a great record. But no, they had so much material. They had gone to India. They were writing all this mu they, uh, music in India. This is after they come back from India. They have this entire record. Uh -huh. So they had tons of material they were writing on their own. And uh, they didn't have the discipline to, to like, eliminate, which, you know, oh. like most writers know. Yeah. Like, Editing is as important as the writing, almost. Leaving, yeah. What you leave out is as important as what you put in. Sure. You know?